Now those last verses, brethren, that we just read here, um, are the focus of chapter 15 in uh, Luke. This thy brother was dead, was alive again, was lost, and is found. And it is meet that you should be merry and be glad. Now, now when you go through Luke chapter 15, there are three parables. And uh, the first parable is the parable of the lost sheep. The second one is the parable of the lost coin. And then you get to the parable of the prodigal son. Three lost things that are gathered up uh, with great joy in the mercy of God. And uh, that's the focus of the whole chapter. Now, if you notice verse 7 in the chapter, you, you get the culmination or the, or the main uh, point that's being made in the parable of the lost sheep. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth. Don't miss that. Over one sinner that repenteth more than over 99 just persons which need no repentance. And when you think of the prodigal son, you get those two categories, the prodigal and the older brother who didn't think he needed repentance. But there's joy in heaven over one sinner that repents. And then in verse uh, 10, you get the conclusion of the parable of the lost coin. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repents. So I think there can be no question that's the focus of the chapter. Three parables being told uh, to bring home to us in various ways how, how the mercy of God is so magnified in the free forgiveness of sinners who repent. Marvellous truth, gospel truth, and uh, one I think that we uh, can all uh, do well to focus on. But now, the parable of the prodigal son has a special emphasis on it, or in it, and uh, that emphasis, I think, is upon uh, the, what you could call the prodigal or prodigious mercy of God as a father uh, to the repenting sinner as he comes home. And that comes out especially in verse uh, 20. He, the father, arose and his son is coming towards him and is thinking to himself and in his own heart, fully convinced that he's not worthy even to be called his son. He just needs to be given a place right in the background, uh, like, like the lowest servant. And the father arose and when he was a great way off, he saw him and he had compassion and he ran and he fell on his neck and kissed him. That's, that's a glorious perspective on God that comes out uh, in this parable. And I'd like us to be able to look at the parable bearing that perspective on the mercy of God uh, clearly in our minds. So let's begin this morning by looking at what I'd like to call the prodig prodigal mercy. There's an urgent need for mercy described in this passage. There's a, a tenderly severe mercy. That might sound like a contradiction, but I'll explain that. A tenderly severe mercy. And then there's a, a prodigious freeness to that mercy. An overwhelming abundance and freeness to it. So first of all, in the parable, you can see that there is definitely a very urgent need for mercy. Uh, there is a prodigal child that's described. Now, in Christian circles, uh, most, most of us would be very familiar with the idea of a prodigal child. It's, uh, we speak that way of, uh, of one of our children or grandchildren or someone else who's a Christian's children They've grown up knowing the Lord and have turned their back very foolishly, self-destructively on, on all the goodness of God and of God himself. And they've gone off into the world and they make a complete mess of their lives and how, how desperate at times that can be. And so we're familiar with it, but th this is where we get that idea 
of a, of a prodigal child from in our Christian thinking. And, uh, and so we need to look at this prodigal, I think, not only from the point of view of the outrageous sinfulness and unthankfulness of his sin, but of how that presents him as an object of great need for the mercy of God. And that's, I think, the emphasis in this passage. There's a great need created by sin for the mercy of God. And so I, I hope you get what I'm trying, trying to get across here. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to reverse our normal way of thinking, um, or at least to show a different perspective on it. Sin is a dreadful thing. It, 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 it's horrendously offensive to God. Uh, hell is there to punish it. These things are all true. But, but sin is also a crying need. And the sinner is in a, is in a crying, desperate need. And, uh, and that's what comes out here. And that great need is for mercy. And so there's, there's, there's a great and urgent need here. Uh, whenever we see that sort of need, we, we, we can't but remember that it's created uh, by a sin. The disobedience to God uh, that takes a hold of people in their heart and in their affections and leads them into all manner of self-destructive uh, ruin which is so offensive to God. Now, just notice that the problem with this young boy or this young man, it was not his father's home. The father in this particular parable represents uh, the, the, the God of the covenant, uh, the God who does all things well, the God who is in every way perfectly balanced and perfectly ordered and wise and gracious and and is in every way working things for the for the ultimate good and blessing through all, all the means that are used uh, for every person who's in his household. God never does anybody wrong. And uh, God, God doesn't, by in the way he deals with us in our, our homes either, ever do something that is cruel or unkind. God doesn't mess up like human parents do. By the way, that's a pretty important thing for us. And uh, it's important for us as parents. We recognize we mess up badly and our mistakes affect our children. And uh, as children, we look at that and we think of our family and our household and we think to ourselves, well, mum and dad certainly made a mess of that. Uh, I think if you live through the growth of your own children to maturity, some of them would have come to you and they would have said to you in various ways, mum, dad, you really didn't do a good job. And uh, I feel as so you injured me in this way and this way and this way. And even sometimes they'll say things to us like, your Christianity and the way you modeled it before me was not nice. And I didn't like it. And I've had to work through that, they'll even say to us, the fact that you so misrepresented the character of God in the way you behaved towards me and dealt with me, but I've had to distance you from God so I could come to God and know him for myself in a whole new way. We make all sorts of mistakes in our homes and they affect our children. God doesn't. God doesn't. He, he is the perfect father in heaven. And uh, we, we can trust him and confide in, in him completely without any reservation whatsoever. So that's a really important thing to take hold of here. The problem was not with God and not with the home. The problem was with the young man. What was his problem? Well, his problem was not only his conduct. That was bad. But all conduct is a little bit like fruit on a tree, isn't it? And uh, you look at, his, at the fruit and you say, well, that's not good, that's bad. You can't then say, well, the tree's good, even though the fruit's bad. Now, what we've got to do is we've got to trace the fruit back down to the root, and the root of our sinful conduct, uh, and especially the, the sinful conduct of the person who's completely unconverted, 
is the heart. The heart. As the heart is. So out of the heart flow the issues of life. And this young man had a sinful heart. And because he had a sinful heart, all the affections of his soul, well, let's put that a different way, all the things he really wanted, all the stuff he thought would make him happy, was away from God and away from all that God requires. And so the father in his home to this young man appears as the great party pooper, the great wet blanket on life, the great hindrance to happiness, the great thing that you have to escape if you're going to find happiness in your life and fulfilment and self-expression so you can be all that you want to be. You've got to get out away from God and away from what appears to the unconverted soul to be a straight jacket that's strangling you and keeping you from happiness. So the young man, as soon as he gets to the place where he can do it, he claims what right, 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 is his right uh, and his inheritance, and he says, I'm out of here. Give me everything, and I want to go, and I want to find the happiness that you've restricted me from. And so he takes everything, and he takes it with him into a far country, and he just does everything he wants to do. Wants to do. Out of his heart come the issues of life. Out of his sinful heart come all the pleasures and desires of sin. And he gives himself completely to him. And the older brother, uh, when, when he describes him, uh, says, look, he's gone off there and he's devoured uh, his inheritance on righteous living and hordes. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll, the stuff that makes young people tick and, and appeals to everybody. This young man just went out and into it he went, out of the church, out of, and put it in our context, out of his family, out of the church, out of the principles of Christianity, and he gave himself over to the world. Well, okay. How many, how many, how many multitudes of young people who grow up in all the privileges of the Christian church do exactly that. How many, perhaps even, of our own children, perhaps even our own grandchildren, have done exactly that? What's their greatest need? What is their greatest need? Well, they're exactly what the prodigal here had as his greatest need. It was... It was the mercy of God. Not mercy that just says a wink and a nod, she's all okay. Not mercy that just says, doesn't matter about your life, doesn't matter about your heart, it's all okay. That's not mercy. That's cruelty. Because a wink and a nod, uh, a sinful heart that's giving itself over to worldliness and debauchery is a wink and a nod that says, go to hell. Be happy all the way till you drop over the pit and all is lost eternally. That's not mercy and that's not love. And that's not the way God operates when he's going to save a soul. It's not a wink and a nod. It doesn't matter. No, God goes to work through mercy, through mercy. Wise, holy, righteous, loving mercy. Because don't forget, the attributes of God, though we can distinguish them in our mind for clarity, the attributes of God are all one glorious goodness of God. And whenever God's, for example, merciful he's righteously and in a holy manner and in all perfect justice and wisdom merciful he doesn't just go from mercy to the exclusion of everything else no god brings the whole of his glorious holy perfection to bear through mercy 
upon a sinner. And that's why whenever a sinner comes into the hand of God's mercy, all sorts of amazing things start to happen in their life. And look what happens to this young fellow. Mercy takes hold. Mercy is pursuing him uh, like uh, that, that very famous poem you might have heard about from Francis Thompson. You ever heard The Hound of Heaven? Heard of the poem, The Hound of Heaven? You all love to Google stuff? Google this. Please wait till you get home. But Google this when you get home and read The Hound of Heaven. And, and uh, Francis Thompson was a, a man of great privilege and, and, and great uh, opportunities and tremendous talents. He, he, he grew up in a Christian home. It was a Roman Catholic home, but he grew up in a Christian home and he had all the tremendous privileges. And little bit by little bit, he sunk down as he pursued pleasures into the place where he was a complete heroin addict. Complete heroin addict, sleeping rough, out on the streets, under bridges, and uh, and uh, there he was one night, uh, and he realised that he was just like the prodigal son. And God began to work in his life, but he had to bring him down to the very end of himself and to a degradation almost indescribable, just like this boy in the parable. At the end of his poem, he says something like, that the hound of heaven finally caught up with him and God said to him, when you pushed me away, you pushed love away. And that's exactly where God's going to work in people's lives to bring them to that point. And that's where the product, he goes out, he spends his money and he runs out doesn't work. It does, this does not produce a lasting happiness. He goes out and he, he just wastes it all and it runs out and he goes to someone in that faraway land. Uh, 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 obviously, this is describing someone who's not a believer. It's a worldly, ungodly person and the tender mercies of the wicked are cruel. Don't ever forget that. Only Christians truly know what compassion and tender mercy is that comes with no strings attached and gives itself to others, a little bit like Jesus Christ has given to us. But the tender mercies of the wicked are cruel. And this man gives him a job, sends him out with the pigs. No money, no food, out with the pigs, look after the pigs. And there he finds himself with his with his nose like a pig in the trough, eating the husks with the swine. And he wakes up, it seems, one morning, or he's thinking, maybe laying awake at night, and, and, and he reflects on it. Verse 17, he came to himself and he said, how many hired servants my father had have bread enough to spare, and I perish for hunger. Oh dear, what a mess. I've made of my life. What can I do? I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. Now notice that. As he starts to come to himself, he thinks of home, he thinks of God, he thinks of his goodness, and he thinks of him in terms of his father, and he thinks in terms of going home and saying, Father, I am so sorry about what son my sins, my sins, what looked like pleasures, weren't. What looked like happiness, wasn't. And when I get home, I'm just going to say this. I've sinned against heaven. God's now in the picture again. Completely different way. And against you. Now, whatever can produce such a change in a human being's life. Whatever could pick someone up out of being a complete slave to the pleasures of sin and create now a person who's turned against sin and turned back to God. Well, here's the answer. Mercy. Divine mercy. 
Now you might think this is a bit odd, but I want to quote to you from our shorter catechism, the question and answer about repentance. Now don't shut off because this is a doctrine, because this is in incredibly important. It describes a, a, a genuine reality of what God produces in our hearts as Christians and what every prodigal needs. What is repentance? Repentance is a saving grace. In other words, it's something that God gives freely through Jesus Christ to sinners who don't deserve the least good thing. He gives it as mercy and it's for salvation. This is going to make the difference. Repentance is a saving grace whereby a sinner, out of a true sense of his sin and apprehension of the mercy of God in Christ, does with grief and hatred of his sin turn from it unto God with full purpose and endeavour after new obedience. But did you catch the point? It's like the linchpin and, and, and what you could call uh, the, the very human psychological necessity that God gives to the person who's in the mess of sin to give them hope. Did you catch it in that definition? Well, here it is. And with an apprehension of the mercy of God in Christ. That's what makes repentance the overwhelmingly, incredibly powerful thing that turns a person from sin to God, from the places of sin to the delight of God, and takes them from pursuing sin all the way to hell to turning them around from the very heart and soul and so that they pursue God all the way to heaven. That's, that's what it is, an apprehension coming to understand in the experiences of our own life the incredible, amazing reality that there's mercy with God for a sinner like me. How can that be? And the catechism says, the mercy of God in Christ. That's how it can be. Now, brethren, the mercy of God, amongst, you could say so much about it, but the mercy of God I consider to be, because I think like a person who thinks in pictures, I consider it to be like this. The mercy of God comes into the world in the person of Jesus. And the Lord Jesus has all the sins of his people placed on his holy frame and he carries it all the way to the cross and he pays the penalty for sin so that sins can be forgiven. The mercy of God has a foundation in the satisfaction of the righteousness of God. God does not give sin a wink and a nod. No, mercy is going to come because God has satisfied his righteousness, his judgment against sin in the person of his son on the cross of Calvary. And there the Lord Jesus hangs in those hours of darkness on the cross of Calvary, uh, groaning under the weight of our sin and experiencing the torments of, of hell poured out into his holy soul because of our sins. And then when it's all done, and when because he's God and man, he can, he's given that infinitely worthy sacrifice, he, he only could do that. Anyone else apart from one who's God and man would have entered into that and never come out of hell. The darkness would have never ended. But because he's God and man, he pays the price. He, he soaks up the judgment by his stripes. We healed. And there comes a moment when into, into his glorious soul, God has poured the judgment for my sins. And Jesus Christ, from the darkness, lifts up his voice and he cries. You know what he cried? Do you know what he cried? It is finished. And here's mercy. At that moment, I, I can see the rising, emanating from the Lord Jesus Christ as the one, the Lamb of God, who's satisfied for our sins and purchased God's blessing. There radiates 
a glorious specter of, of mercy. It's like it's like the shining of a light. It's like the breaking out of the sun of righteousness into the world, and it, and it radiates the world. It's the mercy of God. Want to change the picture a bit? Where there he stands with the mercy of God radiating out from him and flowing then out of the drops of his blood, for it forms a mighty river, a stream that turns into a mighty river and an ocean of mercy. And it is so abundant. It's so gloriously, magnificently abundant. And it's so sufficient for every sin. But it makes it possible for God to stand like that father with his face towards sinners and with his heart going out to his people lost in their sins to look out and to watch for them. And every particular sinner that hears the gospel has that mercy of God held before them in the person of Jesus Christ. And God is saying to them, come home, come home. Why would you die? Why would you perish in sin? Come home and I'll receive you. Now, mercy has in it all, all the power of God and all the wisdom of God to do what is necessary to bring us home to God willingly. <laughs> Think about that. Here's this boy giving himself to all the pursuit of sin, the pleasures of sin, and, and the addictive nature of sin's taken hold of him right to the core of his being because sin's like that, it's addictive. And, and now God's got to break the addiction. And so God does what's necessary to show the evil and the destructive nature of sin. Think of the boy with his nose in the pig's trough. But at the same time, in complete stark contrast, God shows the glorious, shining radiance of his mercy. And as the sinner lifts his nose, as it were, out of the trough, and catches a glimpse of the glorious mercy of God. Its winsome power takes hold of his soul, and he says, that's better than this. That's better than this ruin. That's better than the pleasures of sin. That's better than anything else besides. That's what I need. That's what I've got to have. And the sinner has the power of sin broken in his heart. And the sinner has the bondage of sin, the chains Cast off him. And the mercy of God, like a light at the end of the tunnel, draws him or her towards it. And, and, and that's what God does. He brings every sinner to himself willingly by renewing their hearts, breaking the bonds of the pleasures of sin and drawing them with the cords of love to himself and into his mercy into his mercy. And it's so prodigious, that mercy, as it is uh, the fullness of God's love and grace purchased by Jesus Christ in that glorious work on the cross that I just described to you. It's so prodigious that there's not one sinner that ever comes to God that he will ever find that God's mercy is not enough to do two things. To pardon his or her sins. Because think about that. Now, I, I had someone say to me just the other day, you might have heard this too. I had someone say to me the other day, as I was trying to share the gospel with them, and tell them about how free God's forgiveness was. They said to me, yes, but you don't know what I've done. You don't know what I've done. And all you could say is, yes, but you don't know yet 
as you need to. What God has done. You, you don't understand yet what Jesus Christ has done. Because no matter how great your sin may be, God's mercy in Jesus Christ is far greater. It's infinitely greater. It's eternally greater. It's magnitudes above and beyond what your sins are. Because it's the precious blood of the Lamb of God himself on the cross of Calvary who's purchased the forgiveness of sin and one drop of his blood is sufficient to wash you clean and make you whiter than the snow. <laughs> now, if that ever breaks in on that needy soul that is saying, yes, but you don't know what I've done, what's that person going to do? What do you think they'd do? I'll tell you what I think they'd do. I think they run so fast to the God of mercy through Jesus Christ that you couldn't stop them. They'd be like a prodigal over hill and down dale, over hill and down dale, over the creeks and up over the mountains. But they'd, they'd, they'd be headed for God. They'd be headed for the mercy. They'd be saying to themselves, oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this mess I've made of my life and the ruination of sin? And, and they'd say, well, I know God can and does in his prodigious mercy towards sinners in Jesus Christ there's enough for me to. And that's what Paul was saying, by the way, in, in the, the book of Timothy, when, it, when he says, God saved me first, the chief of sinners, as an example that will follow to anyone after. If he can save me, he can save them too. And that's true for us all. But turn your Bible with me just briefly uh, to the Gospel of John, uh, verse, uh, chapter 6. I'd just like to read to you a verse here and then apply it a little bit and then say amen. <clears throat> John chapter 6. You want, you want verse uh, 37. All that the Father giveth me, says Jesus, shall come to me. Now think of the prodigal son with the, mercy, the severe mercy of God, God doing everything that's necessary in connection with his providence to bring the person to nothing. And that person hearing the gospel and getting an apprehension of the mercy of God in Christ and coming by faith to Jesus. Will they be received? Will mercy open its arms and take hold of them? What does Jesus say? All the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. That's the promise of mercy. It's like having the Lord Jesus Christ appear in the gospel, as it were, out of the blue, in the ruination of our life, this is what our prodigals need. It's like having Jesus come to them and stand with his arms open wide as he's clothed in all the glorious garments of salvation, radiating mercy and saying to us, you need not fear. There's a place for you. I'll in no wise cast you out if you'll come to me like a prodigal is returning with an apprehension of the mercy of God in Christ. That's an amazing, incredible mercy that God has provided for sinners. It's powerful enough to do what it takes to bring them all the way home. And you better believe it, when they come home, they'll be met by the mercy of God. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for an opportunity this morning just to reflect on these verses for a moment. 
Lord, we, we, we believe that you are a God of mercy. We, we, we know where your mercy comes from, from the cross and the, and the glorious redemption of Jesus for us. And Father, we pray, if there's any of us who are still strangers uh, to that experience of being brought powerfully home to the mercy of God for the pardon of our sins and to get our lives completely remade, if, if we're still off like a prodigal in the distance, then, Father, please, do what it takes. Bring us home. It's a, it's a terrifying prayer that we pray. Lord, we, when we pray that prayer, we think of all the, 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 the troubles and the woe and the pain that ruination brings into our life through sin. But Lord, do what it takes. Do what it takes to me. We, we need to pray. Do what it takes to my wife, to my son, my daughter, my grandchildren. Do, Lord, do what it takes to bring us all the way home into the arms of your mercy and into peace, to comfort, and into a joy unspeakable and full of glory. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat>